work with uh, Sampath Kanan at Penn, Elhanan Mossel, uh, who since then moved to MIT, and Swagato Sanyal, who uh, actually since then, uh, he moved to one of the IATs. Um, all right, so um, let me start with uh, some definitions. Uh, so even though uh, I said we're going to be sketching over finite fields, mostly we're going to be sketching over the field of two elements because it's the most basic example and um, is going to help us keep the notation relatively simple. And uh, so let me introduce uh, this first definition of what I'm going to call F2 sketching. So imagine we have a binary input X uh, in 0, 1 to the N. Then the parity is just a linear function uh, that computes uh, uh, sum over of two of a bunch of bits. And today I'm going to be also abusing notation quite a bit. Uh, instead of just taking the sum over of two, I'm going to be uh, you know, putting this uh, circle plus sign, sort of an XOR of a bunch of bits. Over of two, the same thing. And uh, our first definition is going to be a deterministic linear sketch. A deterministic linear sketch is just a collection of k parity functions. Uh, so you, uh, you take your x, you compute a bunch of parities uh, by taking sums over k fixed subsets of, uh, of n. And you get these uh, values of these parities. Uh, so a bit of terminology today, I'm going to uh, call uh, this number k uh, the dim dimension of the sketch. And uh, uh, for the case of F2, uh, the dimension is basically the same as the bit complexity of storing the sketch itself, right? Because each, um, each value of the sketch just takes a single bit to store. So the dimension and the size uh, for F2 sketches are the same. If uh, you're going to increase your field size to, say, Fp, then dimension and the sketch size are going to differ by a factor of log p. All right, so that's a deterministic linear sketch. And uh, uh, you know, deterministic linear sketches are very simple. You just take uh, uh, a collection of parities or of certain bits of your input. So now this leads to, uh, to introduce this definition of a randomized linear sketch, which is a distribution over k parity functions. So you pick random subsets, S1 through SK. And you compute the parities uh, over these subsets. So a few remarks here. Um, in a randomized linear sketch, you can pick your subsets uh, from one single joint distribution over, over these subsets. So uh, the subsets do not have to be chosen independently. So there is uh, one joint distribution over them that generates uh, this collection of subsets. All right, so far so good. This is kind of like an important definition, so I just want to make sure that uh, this gets through. Okay, cool. All right, so that's a randomized linear sketch here. And the central question is, uh, imagine we have some function f of x. What we want to know is, can we recover f of x from a small linear sketch over, over some final field, let's say f2? And uh, by small, I mean k should be uh, much, much less than n, because obviously, if, if k equals n, then I can uh, just compute every individual bit as a sketch, and that gives me the entire input, and then I compute f of x. Right? So the question is, can we make uh, this dimension k to be much, much smaller than n and still recover f of x. And uh, uh, again, a few remarks here. Here, let's say uh, we allow uh, some success probability, say 99%. So uh, you can do this uh, in a randomized fashion where the probability is taken only over the choice of random sets for now and does not depend uh, on the input. So this guarantee should really hold for every fixed x. So we're going to assume that uh, the sets that have been sampled from this joint distribution are known at recovery time. And without loss of generality, you can assume that the recovery process is deterministic. Yeah, good place. With the sketch, is not, you're not worried about how long it takes to 
and this is not some sketch that you should be able to update or something. Right, right. So, uh, so the running time for us today is not going to be a concern. So we're only going to be focused on, on the dimension of the space. So, mm -hmm. so j just to make sure, so if the, if the function f is just a parity, then this is trivial. Yeah, it's just one, right? So you just compute that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, during the recovery step, do I get to know what the sets are? That yes, so that's, uh, that's a, this remark right here. So the sets are going to be known to you at the recovery time. So the query, uh, the parity query complexity is an hour count for um, Parity query complexity. So for parity, as uh, as Madhu pointed out, you know the the dimension is going to be just one, right? You uh, you compute uh, just this single parity, and that gives you k equals one. Yeah, yeah. and um, well, parity parity complexity, you can query. Uh, sorry, parity query complexity, so if you can if you can recover from k uh, parities, then you can. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. So parity query complexity, um, I think should be a lower bound in this case because parity query complexity basically is going to be sort of a. Uh, I guess in parity query complexity, you also like can do this adaptively, for yeah, example, yeah. right? Yeah. This is sort of a non-adaptive version. So yeah, that that would be a win. Okay. Good. Any any other questions? And uh, um, uh, you know, to entertain some of you, if you maybe uh, find this talk uh, to be simple, uh, uh, I'd like to state an open problem up front, uh, so that you can have this in mind. And you know, if you manage to solve this, then uh, uh, that's going to simplify a lot of things in this line of work. All right. So, what is the uh, the open problem? Uh, so, the open problem is going to be a communication problem. In this communication problem, we have two players, Alice and Bob. Alice holds an input x in 0, 1 to the n. Bob holds an input y in 0, 1 to the n. And they have access to shared randomness. The communication problem is just a simple one-way communication problem where Alice just is sending a single message to Bob, this message m of x. And so far, this is just the general one-way communication complexity setup. Except that the function f is a little special. The function f is uh, what is called an XOR function of the two inputs. Uh, the function f is uh, defined to be some other function uh, of x plus y. Sorry, that's a problematic previous question. So do we know a separation between the parity query complexity and the dimension k for some explicit function? Uh, that is uh, a good question. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe someone knows. Could you repeat the question? The decision tree. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So repeat <coughs> the question. That was just the good question that was just asked. asking, I didn't hear the question. I'm asking, <coughs> what's a uh, uh, explicit function for which there is a separation between the parity query complexity and the dimension ah. just defined? What was the answer? <laughs> so, uh, oh, okay, okay. Actually, actually, the answer I guess is maybe maybe just an address function would be a good example, right? Uh, now that now that I think about it, um, uh, I would think that address function is simple for for parity query complexity, right? Because uh, it would have like parity query complexity log uh, log n basically. That's sort of the difference between adaptive and non-adaptive, I guess, right? And in this setting, uh, as we're going to see. Uh, yeah, so I don't don't often think about parity query complexity. That's why I'm like a little a little rusty on that. Um, uh, but yeah, so that would be would be an exponential separation, like log n versus n, basically. Okay. Um. All right. So uh. So let's go back to this communication problem. The uh, the conjecture here is that um. Let's say an almost uh, shortest message in this communication game uh, has to be a, a randomized linear sketch, or can be a randomized uh, linear sketch. So essentially, uh, the conjecture is that uh, there is nothing better than um, that Alice can do than just to send a bunch of parodies uh, to Bob.
And uh, so this is an open problem on, uh, on a collection of open problems in sublinear algorithms, sublinear dot info. So, so what do you think, almost uh, it's up to a constant factor, or even better, worse? Um, right, so um, as far as I know, this can hold even up to like a constant factor, or even maybe with like some small additive error with like no, no loss in a constant factor. Uh, but, but I want to put this as almost to just encourage people to prove something with maybe like a yeah, loss, right? So, so which would still be pretty interesting. It, is, is f required to be like a total function there, or are you allowed to have some like promise on the the inputs? Uh, sorry, is it again? If are the pairs allowed to have like some promise on the inputs, or is like f required to be defined everywhere? Yeah, so this is a total function, and that's actually important for non-total functions. I think this is totally false. Uh, there's going to be an exponential separation again using uh, some version of generalized address function for for non-total functions. But that, that that's kind of um, uh, kind of fairly simple and kind of besides the point here. We really want this to be a total function. Oh. All right, so. Um, so some progress that we made recently uh, towards uh, resolving this conjecture is we've we managed to show this for a multiplayer version. Uh, so what's a multiplayer version? In the multiplayer version, uh, we have capital N players. Each player has an input in 0, 1 to the N. And they have access to shared randomness. Now the communication is going to be sequential communication where the ith player just sends a message to the i plus first player. Uh, looks like this. And um, imagine that the message uh, just depends on the input xi and the previous message. Uh, we can do sl something slightly more general I'm going to mention in a second. But for now, uh, let's say the message just depends uh, on, the, um, on your own input and the previous message. And again, in the end, uh, the final player outputs f of the sum of all these x inputs. So in this setting, the theorem we can show this is uh, up on ECCC, that if the number of players, capital N, is sufficiently large, and it has to be at least 10 times N, then if there is a protocol where each message mi is at most c bits, then we can construct a randomized f to sketch of size O of c. Right? So if there is like any protocol that can do whatever, uh, send some nonlinear things, we can construct a protocol uh, that uh, is basically f to sketching with only a constant loss here. So this is just some fixed universal constant? Doesn't depend on anything? Um, then that definitely does not depend on anything. And uh, uh, maybe, maybe Shahar remembers what the constant is actually pretty small. It depends on the 10 he puts there. The 10. Right. Yeah. OK, great. So this can also be generalized to, uh, to ZP. Uh, so again, exactly uh, pretty much the same setting. Uh, we have these inputs, uh, but now over uh, zp to the n. So here we are going to incur a log p loss in a couple of places. So first of all, we are going to increase the number of players uh, by a factor of log p. And uh, second, notice that now there is a difference between the dimension and the actual bit complexity of the sketch. Uh, so the dimension of the sketch over ZP is going to be order C, but the bit complexity is going to be log B factor larger. All right, so uh, and that's basically all uh, I want to say today about uh, ZP. For the rest, we're going to focus on the field of two elements. Is it, is it important that S is Boolean in order of this? Um, is it important? Well, so yeah, so we're going to talk about this uh, uh, a little bit later, uh, where we're going to allow some generalizations, we're going to allow some approximation when f is not Boolean, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So specifically, this theorem holds only for Boolean functions? Um, 
Right, so, uh, so there are some generalizations of this which hold not, not only for Boolean functions. But, but then, you know, uh, there is going to be some, some more dependence on some other parameters. Okay. Um. Right. <coughs> All right, so some motivation for, uh, for this line of research. And why did we decide to you know, study, uh, study all these communication games as well? Uh, comes from uh, distributed computing and streaming. So imagine uh, we are in a distributed computing set setting where we have um, a bunch of inputs, x1 through xm, uh, divided between m machines. Um, or more generally, maybe our x is just the sum of uh, these m distributed inputs. So then um, F2 sketching or sketching over ZP is, is very convenient to perform in this distributed scenario because everyone can just compute uh, these sketches locally and uh, send them to the coordinator who, who can then compute uh, the overall linear sketch by just summing up uh, coordinate wise uh, the nearest sketches that have been received. And this gives a coordinator protocol where the coordinator um, only gets k times m communication. So it gets a, a, a sketch of uh, dimension k from each of the m players. And another motivation is uh, is the streaming setting. So in the streaming setting, imagine we start with x, which is initially uh, just all zeros. And then we receive updates where each update is just a coordinate in x. And that coordinate, we're just going to flip. So if you have updates like this, 1, 3, 3, then we just flip the first coordinate, third coordinate, eighth coordinate, and then flip the uh, third coordinate back uh, from 1 to 0. And again, you can notice that uh, a linear sketch can allow us uh, to recover f of x with key bits of space. Uh, where I disregard the, uh, the storage of the sets, we're going to talk about this in a second in the streaming setting specifically. All right, and so uh, also uh, there is a connection between, uh, say, the length of the stream here and the number of players. Uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, super clear right now, but um, eventually, you know, we're going to show that uh, if you show a lower bound for the uh, communication game, that's also going to imply that we can distribute uh, uh, the player's inputs among the players and sort of think of them as, as streaming updates. Yeah, sorry, that was not sort of super clear. Um, all right, so, uh, so essentially this is going to imply optimality of uh, processing streaming uh, updates of, of this form. As long as your as your stream is sufficiently long, and so for example from uh, from this result uh, that I mentioned about the multiplayer version, uh, the overall length of the stream would have to be order n squared, uh, because we're going to have uh, to have linear number of players in n, and each one has n bits. And so so if, if you think of all these players' inputs as updates then the overall length of the stream would be quadratic in n. All right, some uh, frequently asked questions. There have been a lot of good questions so far. Um, uh, but I want to add some more. Uh, some frequently asked questions are uh, why are we looking at F2 updates instead of plus minus 1? In fact, as it turns out, for a lot of applications, um, even if you know the sign of update uh, to your underlying input, whether it goes uh, from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0, it doesn't really matter that much, uh, although there are some exceptions. So another uh, frequently asked question uh, that I think someone already mentioned is, uh, do we store these random sets? Um, in the streaming setting specifically, uh, you can de-randomize streaming algorithms using Nissan's uh, pseudo-random generator. 
uh, which only introduces an extra log n factor in space. So that's why uh, I uh, mentioned earlier that we don't really worry about the storage uh, of these random sets. Uh, some applications. Uh, so one application that I think is, uh, is quite interesting is dynamic graph streaming algorithms have been recently shown uh, uh, in the last few years to be basically based uh, pretty much all of them on this primitive called L0 sampling. And L0 sampling can be done optimally using F2 sketching as been shown uh, last year. So basically, uh, uh, this is uh, maybe the most important application. And uh, another question often asked is why, uh, why do we want to compute f exactly? So far we're trying to compute f exactly. Why not do this approximately? And I'm going to talk about this uh, later. There should be one more frequently asked question, which is, is there any function which has a nice, you know, what's a good example to start with? Uh, yeah, we're going to get to this. This is going to be like the, the bulk of the talk today. It's very various different uh, examples. and. Uh, Right. Yeah. Are there any streaming examples where you know F two updates are definitely not sufficient, or it's not sufficient to consider F two sample updates? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so one example is going to be a majority function uh, in the Boolean setting. Okay. Mm. All right. So, um. So okay, to, uh, to introduce what, what we can actually sketch and basically uh, um, answer uh, Madhu's question, uh, let's start with um, understanding first what can deterministic sketches do versus what randomized sketches can do. So function f has a deterministic sketch, it turns out, if and only if. Uh, and this is kind of like a trivial definition of what a deterministic sketch really is. You just take an arbitrary function g over a collection of key priorities. So this is uh, just directly what, what a deterministic sketch is. But it turns out this is equivalent to saying uh, the following. f has what is called Fourier dimension k. And I haven't described what that is yet. But turns out, uh, so this property you can quickly check using just the Fourier spectrum of the function f. And this is a fairly folklore fact. Um, so it's been known for a while. So I'm gonna explain what this means uh, in a second, but this is kind of a convenient way of checking, you know, uh, what's going on with the deter deterministic sketch complexity, really. And as it turns out, uh, randomization can help a lot uh, for, uh, for, say, a disjunction of n inputs. If I take uh, an or a disjunction of x1 through xn, then uh, using this Fourier dimension argument, or, or otherwise, you can easily convince yourself that uh, there is nothing you can really do about or deterministically. If you compute at n minus 1 parities, then you still need uh, more information about x. And that corresponds to the fact that or has Fourier dimension equals n. But with randomness, uh, sketching OR is actually very simple. So if you want to sketch OR, all you really want to know is, is there a single one bet, uh, single bet that equals to one in your input? And to check that, just pick a bunch of random subsets, it's one through ST, say log one over delta of them if you want uh, success probability one minus delta. And uh, uh, what you want to make sure is, you know, that one of these subsets uh, catches this input that's equal to one, and uh, if, uh, if that happens, and if also your parity values to one, then you're gonna get a one in, uh, in the outcome of your linear uh, sketch. And so that's gonna happen basically with probability uh, one fourth. So in that case, you output a one. So this is a, a motivational example for when uh, randomized um, uh, linear sketches can be much superior to, uh, to deterministic ones. Right, so, good. Right. so this is useful to keep in mind to understand better, you know, what's going on uh, in general with uh, linear sketching because we're going to be alluding to this example later. 
All right, so uh, so now I uh, mentioned some free analysis. Let's go over this real quick. Kind of look at the audience, and I'm guessing that everyone more or less is on top of their free analysis here. Uh, so uh, I'm just gonna go through this super quickly. Uh, imagine we have a function maps zero one to the n to zero one. Uh, free analysis, we're gonna apply an notation switch. We place zeros with ones, uh, ones with minus ones. Uh, so all functions are really gonna be mapping minus one uh, one to the n into minus one one. Then functions uh, as a two to the n dimensional vectors form a vector space. So we're gonna be uh, thinking of a function f as just the stack of two to the n values. Uh, it looks like a vector. Uh, then uh, the inner product on functions uh, captures correlation. If you if you scale this inner product by dividing it by uh, to the minus n and gives an expectation of a uniformly random x of f of x times g of x. And uh, only for Boolean functions, uh, it holds that, uh, uh, that the two norm is, is going to be one uh, after this scaling. All right, so um, key fact is that every function can be uniquely represented as a multilinear polynomial. And uh, this polynomial has uh, basis functions chi s uh, and uh, the coefficients of this uh, multilinear polynomial are the Fourier coefficients. All right, so um, right, so standard facts from free analysis, Parseval, uh, uh, and how, how do you compute uh, how, how do you compute the Fourier coefficients? All right, so now uh, let's talk about this notion of Fourier dimension. Uh, to talk about Fourier dimension, we will have to think uh, about these uh, Fourier sets S, which index the Fourier coefficients as vectors themselves in F2 to the M. Right. So, uh, so we have these sets which index the Fourier coefficients uh, set here. So that becomes a vector in F2 to the M. And uh, uh, we say that a function F has a Fourier dimension K if there is a k-dimensional subspace of f2 to the n here, which contains all of the spectrum of, of our function. Namely, uh, if I take the summation of the Fourier coefficients uh, squared in the subspace ak, then I'm gonna get a one which has uh, the, full, um, uh, the full spectrum. So that's the same as the dimension of the span of the support of the function, Fourier support? Uh, sorry, is it again? Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. Sure. Um, all right, so... Um, and uh, so why does this give us uh, 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 a deterministic sketch right away? Uh, that's because if you just pick some arbitrary basis uh, of size k in, in AK and uh, compute the values of the parities over these bases, then we can compute the entire uh, uh, summation of all these Fourier coefficients uh, and get the, val uh, the value of f. Right? Because uh, remember that in this setting, uh, I think learning theory people often get confused here. Uh, in this setting, uh, we do know all the uh, Fourier coefficients because the function f is fixed. What we don't know is the values of all these parities. Like, but because uh, the parities are indexed by sets in a k-dimensional subspace, uh, it suffices to just compute k of them on the basis, and the rest of the parities you can figure out uh, just by linear combinations. Yeah. Another way to think of it is punta after linear transformation. Right, yeah, exactly, sure. All right. All right, so that's why um, uh, Fourier dimension just gives you a, a deterministic linear sketch right away. Um, okay, so now we're gonna move on to some last trivial facts. And um, uh, I'd like to describe uh, what you can do with linear sketching using this uh, scenario of when you think of a function as a sort of a simple function plus some kind of noise. Uh, so imagine that your function f looks like a sum of two 
uh, Boolean functions g and h. And uh, so far we know that k-dimensional uh, functions, uh, fun functions with small uh, Fourier dimensions are easy. So let's take the, uh, this to be the easy part. And there's going to be also some other part that we're going to call noise. So h in this case uh, is going to be our noisy function and g is going to be a simple function. All right. So with deterministic sketching, it turns out, and I think this is a uh, very beautiful result due to San Yao, is that if your function um, has small Fourier sparsity, then it also has a non-trivially small uh, Fourier dimension. So what I mean by that? So imagine your function uh, has some number of non-zero Fourier coefficients. Uh, this is also known as Fourier sparsity. Then it turns out that uh, somehow it is its uh, Fourier dimension is only square root. Uh, so actually, there's some 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 log factor here. Uh, um, it's only basically up to a log factor square root uh, of the sparsity. So notice that this can only possibly be true for for Boolean functions. If the function um, here at hand was not Boolean, there's absolutely no way uh, you know, uh, uh, this could happen because you could just make all the uh, Fourier coefficients be linearly independent from each other. But somehow this constraint that the resulting function has to be Boolean imposes a certain, uh, uh, certain restriction on what the Fourier dimension of this function can be. And it can only be square root sparsity somehow. And it's a quite a surprising fact. And one consequence of our work is that this can't actually be improved even with randomness. Um, and even under the assumption that your input is uniform. But uh, so, uh, so one example when this cannot be improved is, is the addressing function. So, so by that you mean g is the addressing function? Uh, actually, h. So g, actually never mind g if, uh, if you want to keep things simple, just take g to be zero. Right? Just think of h to be sort of the only interesting part for a moment. But here I just want to say things more generally and say maybe you can add some like small k-dimensional part. All right, so, okay. so it's like saying that the Fourier dimension is of most square root of the sparsity? Right, right. So another way to interpret this is just saying Fourier dimension is noise up to up to some log factor. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, so now let's go uh, go one step forward and talk about randomization. How can randomization uh, handle noise? So one type of noise that we've already seen a basic example of is a sparse noise in the original domain. So imagine that your function looks like an OR function. So OR function is basically constant one, just corrupted on a single input. So then basically you can generalize this trick with random parities. And uh, if you take log of, um, of the sparsity of your noise function, then that's gonna um, give you a bound on uh, on the after sketch complexity here. Just but take that many random parities. Essentially, that's that's the only thing uh, you should do here. And uh, you can't really improve this uh, in terms of dependence on um, on the magnitude of the noise. And uh, a final uh, example here, which I also find fairly interesting, is. From the work of Brook and Smolensky, um, one can derive uh, another non-trivial sketch uh, that can handle Fourier L1 noise. So imagine uh, the Fourier L1 norm of your function is small. Then you can con construct a sketch uh, whose complexity depends quadratically on the Fourier L1 norm of the noise here. So essentially, the sketch boils down to sampling um, 
sample imperatives from the L1 distribution in the Fourier domain. All right, so, uh, so some examples of functions with a small uh, Fourier L1 norm would be uh, something like a small decision tree, uh, DNF, some such thing. All right, so, um, so now let's talk about uh, some, uh, some technical results on so how can we uh, show a hardness result for, for randomized linear scattering? So we talked about, uh, about a bunch of upper bounds so far. Here is one tool that uh, you can use to show hardness of randomized linear scattering. So if you can show that a function is not well concentrated on k-dimensional Fourier subspaces, uh, then we're gonna get a lower bound. And by uh, not concentrated, I mean that for every k-dimensional Fourier subspace A, the sum of squared Fourier coefficients outside of A is at least one minus gamma. So this means that um, you don't have more than gamma fraction of the spectrum inside any k-dimensional subspace. So then we can show that uh, any k-dimensional after sketch is gonna be making error that depends on gamma. But think of gamma as a constant for a moment, uh, uh, say 0.1, uh, then you're gonna be making uh, some constant error here. So is this error in the worst case or is it even average error or some distribution on exits? Oh, that's a great question. So this is actually gonna hold even uh, over uniform distribution of x. Um, so the converse of this does not hold. Uh, so concentration on a low dimensional Fourier subspace will not imply that you have a good sketch. So that would only be true in a distributional setting <coughs> that, that Madhu basically asked about. All right, so, uh, and this is how you can uh, immediately get some, some basic results uh, about F2 sketching. You can show that uh, functions which are not uh, gamma concentrated on sublinear dimensional Fourier subspaces are almost all symmetric functions, uh, as long as your symmetric function is not Fourier close to a constant or, uh, or say a parity of uh, all the bets. Um, for example, majority is, uh, is another uh, good example here. It's a symmetric function, uh, not close to a constant, so you get immediately a linear lower bound for that. And uh, here I kind of mentioned it's not an extractor. If you have an extractor, then you can also get lower bounds from, from extractors here. Um, all right, so some other examples uh, which are non-symmetric are tribes. Uh, you can get a lower bound for tribes. Uh, for functions like recursive majority, and uh, I think for quite a few other recursive things like this, you can uh, get lower bounds from, from this uh, concentration argument. All right, so, um, so it's natural uh, to, uh, to make a definition here and say that uh, we can introduce this notion of approximate Fourier dimension. Uh, so this is just a recap of what you already know. Uh, so let's define uh, the approximate Fourier dimension to be the smallest integer d such that f is gamma concentrated on some Fourier subspace of dimension d. So the dimension uh, gamma of f. Uh, so um, just a simple illustration uh, in uh, in F to the end, this would be, uh, let's say, a three-dimensional subspace. And uh, I want to find this uh, smallest d in this case, let's say maybe d equals three, so that at least the gamma uh, fraction of uh, my sum of squares is contained inside this three-dimensional subspace. All right, so, uh, so Fourier dimension uh, is, is gonna help us in a distributional setting, as, as I already mentioned. Sketching over the uniform distribution is in fact characterized by this Fourier dimension. 
So imagine that now we're measuring error not for arbitrary x, but x is uniformly distributed over 0, 1 to the n. Uh, the simplest argument would show that uh, if you manage to capture epsilon fraction of your spectrum in a subspace of dimension d, then you immediately get a sketch with error 1 minus epsilon. So basically, you're going to fix your subspace uh, that has, uh, has enough of the spectrum. And then you're just going to um, output the sign of uh, this truncated Fourier expression just over, over these uh, d-dimensional subspace. And that's going to give you error 1 minus epsilon. So that's actually a uh, standard, standard district coming from the learning the theory literature. And uh, that means that over um, uh, uniform distribution of x, the probability that g of x agrees with f of x is at least epsilon. Uh, so this is a little bit suboptimal in a sense that, uh, say, when epsilon is pretty small, your error is close to 1, but it really should be, uh, should be close to half. Uh, so uh, uh, we just refined this a little bit and uh, got the error to be what, what it should be uh, when epsilon is small to be 1 minus epsilon over 2. Um, so the way to do this is you can um, refine this sign trick a little bit by picking theta from a, uh, some simple distribution. Uh, so that's the distribution of theta that we're going to use. And then um, you take this Fourier expansion, uh, subtract theta from this uh, distribution, and output g theta of x. Um, exactly why this is the right thing to do, actually, um, I'm not sure. Um, it would be great to actually have some intuition for why uh, for why this, uh, this seems, to be, seems to be a good thing to do. So the sketch is deterministic, but the recovery is randomized? Um, okay, so I think you can de-randomize uh, if you want. That's, yeah. That's sort of a simple way to describe it, but, but you can de-randomize if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> All right, so, um, so now, now let me connect this whole uh, uh, discussion with, uh, with communication complexity. And um, let's start with, uh, uh, with one-way communication complexity of these XOR functions. Uh, so this is basically what I stated uh, in, in, in the open problem up front. Imagine we have these two players, uh, else and Bob, they have access to shared randomness and want to compute f plus uh, f of x plus y. So Alice is sending a message m of x to Bob. And uh, some examples of the function f plus. If you take this composing function f uh, to be or, then this is going to be f plus is the not equal function of x and y. If, uh, if you take the composing function to be uh, the number of non-zeros greater than d, this is going to be the Hamming distance between x and y is greater than d function. So let's introduce notation that uh, the one-way communication complexity with error epsilon of the function f plus is just the shortest message uh, which allows Bob uh, to compute f plus uh, with error probability epsilon. Uh, so communication complexity of XOR functions is, is well studied uh, and recently there's been a lot of interest. So it's usually studied um, though in, the, uh, in literature in a uh, two-way communication setting, uh, sometimes distributed, sometimes, uh, sorry, sometimes deterministic, uh, sometimes randomized. And there's been uh, a lot of interesting results uh, on this lately. And some of the interest specifically in XOR functions comes from the fact that uh, the log rank conjecture is, is still open even for these special class of functions. But uh, before we talk about uh, randomized, let's talk about deterministic real quick. And um, this is something that I personally find uh, uh, pretty fascinating. 
Um, so deterministic one-way communication complexity of XOR functions turns out to be exactly equal to their F2 sketch complexity. All right, so in deterministic case, we don't have any randomness. You know, Alice is just sending this one message to Bob, and Bob has always uh, uh, to output the correct answer. And from this work by Montanaro and Osborne, it shows, uh, it follows directly basically in a, a very simple one line argument that uh, the communication complexity exactly equals uh, to the linear sketch complexity. You notice there is absolutely no loss here. Uh, there is no additive, multiplicative, or anything factor. It's just exactly equal. It's a deterministic linear sketch. Yeah. There's a Fourier dimension. Yes. <coughs> right, so, and this is a critical part of this argument um, is that uh, both of these quantities are, are basically exactly equal to the Fourier dimension of F. And, uh, and the reason why this is fairly simple to show is because uh, the deterministic one-way communication complexity from Alice to Bob is just really, really simple. It's just log of the number of different rows in the communication matrix. And then, and then you can relay this directly to the, uh, to the Fourier dimension. But randomized one-way communication complexity of XOR functions is, is somehow noticeably more complicated. Right? It's not just log of the number of different rows in the communication matrix. Uh, it actually does not have a particularly simple uh, characterization, well, as far as I know. But, uh, but the striking fact that in the deterministic case, these two quantities are exactly equal is exactly the motivation behind uh, our conjecture here, which basically says um, that uh, Maybe these quantities are approximately or even exactly the same even in the randomized case. Right? So these are uh, just appropriate definitions of, of randomized linear sketch complexity, one-way communication. And uh, so one direction of this is, is straightforward uh, because Alice can just, just send uh, parodies to Bob. Bob uh, computes the parodies uh, of, of his input and, and uses that to compute the parodies for x, x, or y, and, and then recovers f. So the question is, is the inequality true in the other direction? So do you have examples to show that it's actually not equal? No. Um, um, as far as I know, I think could could be exactly equal. Yeah. Isn't that the open question you mentioned earlier? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's... Right, so, so we finally sort of get back to, you know, uh, to, the, to that open question. Yeah. All right, so, um, uh, so that's a question, and um, basically using, um, using our work, we can show that this holds for, um, like, a lot of usual candidates uh, uh, for various counterexamples in free analysis, uh, majority tribes, recursive majority addressing function, uh, almost all symmetric functions, and uh, uh, for degree d f2 polynomials, um, we can show this uh, with a loss of a factor d. So if you want to construct a counterexample, then uh, your counterexample should better be a fairly large degree uh, f2 polynomial. Uh, analogous question for two-way communication is uh, is pretty wide open. Uh, so this is uh, from the work of Hatami Hasseini and Lovett, uh, who ask: uh, Is the parity uh, decision tree complexity polynomially related to the two-way communication complexity of the corresponding XOR function? And uh, in the distributional setting. If x and y are sampled uniformly from 0, 1 to the n, uh, this also holds uh, this conjecture. And that's basically how we get uh, a lot of these results that I mentioned on the previous slide. So in the distributional case, um, uh, just uh, you can define uh, you know, the 
the corresponding communication complexity appropriately. Uh, this is just uh, the Yaw's principle here. And uh, uh, the distributional communication complexity uh, for the uniform distribution is, is just going to be uh, the smallest message that Alice uh, sends to Bob uh, that allows Bob to compute f of x and y uh, for, for uniformly random x and y. So in the distributional setting, uh, it's enough to consider uh, only deterministic messages. And some motivation uh, going back uh, to streaming and distributed uh, would be to say that you know, in streaming and distributed case, maybe, maybe our input is, is uniformly random. All right, so, uh, and as I mentioned, the, uh, this result does hold for, uh, uh, for, for this distributional setting over the uniform distribution. So uh, in the distributional setting, we can show that basically, again, uh, this approximate Fourier dimension, uh, up to some constant factors here and there, controls, um, uh, controls the communication complexity of, uh, of this communication problem. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, optimal up to constant factors in uh, dimension and error because the d dimensional linear sketch, uh, as, as we discussed earlier, has error 1 minus epsilon over 2. So here we get 1 minus epsilon over 6. And uh, the dimension is, uh, is optimal up to some factor 6 again here. All right, so some, uh, some applications uh, of this result for the uniform distribution. Imagine that, that you have an input x that is uh, generated by a stream of updates, and every update just flips a uniformly random coordinate. Uh, and the goal is to maintain f of x throughout the stream. Uh, question how much space is necessary, and the answer is, uh, Basically, the, the approximate Fourier dimension is the right answer because, uh, as, as we discussed, this is up to, up to some constant factors, uh, this approximate Fourier dimension. Uh, and the major open question here, is this true when x is not uniform? So in the streaming setting, this is indeed true for uh, very, very, very long streams. And very, very, very means to the triply exponential um, dependence on n. And this basically follows why this really nice result by Li Nguyen and Woodruff adopted to, the, uh, uh, to our setting that if your stream is extremely long, then there is nothing better you can do. Uh, but for updates over F2, we can also show this for streams of length only quadratic in n uh, via this recent result uh, that I mentioned. All right, and to conclude, uh, here are some uh, highlights of the extensions that we got recently. Uh, approximate F2 sketching, which has been uh, a bit of a follow-up with uh, Samson Ju on this. Uh, so in the approximate setting, uh, uh, we have a function that now is, is real valued, uh, and it's convenient to normalize it to have uh, two norm equals one. So in this case, it turns out a, uh, uh, a good, nice definition to be working with as uh, expected squared error. Um, so here, for every x uh, in expectation over the random sets, we want to have error at most, at most epsilon in uh -huh. squared error. So some interesting facts, if you pick this definition with expected squared error, then uh, under the uniform distribution, basically uh, everything is going to generalize. So this notion of approximate Fourier dimension is going to control uh, the sketching complexity over the uniform distribution with this notion of approximation with expected squared error. Another interesting fact uh, is that uh, this L Fourier L1 sampling, uh, in fact, cannot be improved for, uh, for approximate sketching. Uh, for Boolean functions, I actually don't know um, uh, whether these dependence on the uh, Fourier L1 norm is optimal for sketching. Uh, 
Uh, so, so this joint work with uh, Samsung, what we showed is uh, what you can do in terms of approximate scattering of valuation functions. Uh, starting with something very simple, uh, basically just, just a linear function, and uh, moving on to something more complex, uh, uh, like coverage functions, Metroid ranks, uh, where we have various results depending on the rank R of, uh, of the Metroid rank function. Uh, we also looked at alpha Lipschitz the modular functions, uh, where we get, uh, get some lower bounds. That's a, just a quick uh, one slide summary of, of this joint work. And that's it. Questions? This is a thing, Gregory. Thanks.